Since the 1960s, Moore's law has accurately predicted the evolution trend of processors as to the amount of transistors doubling every two years. But lately, we've seen something odd happening. Processor clocks aren't getting any faster. This has to do with another law called Denard scaling, and it seems that the good old days with silicon chips are over. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. Thankfully, the solution might have been available for quite some time now, and Graphene offers something quite unique to this problem, not only for your everyday processor types, but also quantum computing. In 2009, it was speculated that by now we would have the famous 400 gigahertz processor, but this technology has proven itself to be a bit more complicated than previously thought. However, most scientists, including me, believe that in the next five years, we will see the first graphene commercial hardware come to reality. Today, we take computers for granted, but the story goes way back to the 1800s when in 1823, silicon was discovered by Baron Johns Jacob Berzelius, which much later would become the main component of processors. 80 years later, in 1903, we have the first main step towards the first processor, as Nikola Tesla invented the end logic gate circuit while working on his teleautomaton device, although this invention was more geared towards wireless communication instead of computing. He receives little to no credit for this. Funny enough, four years after Tesla's death, everything started happening. John Bardeen, Walter Bratain, and William Shockley invented the first transistor at Belt Laboratories, followed up by its patent in 1948 and the Nobel Prize in 1956. The first integrated circuit was developed by Robert Noyce and Jack Kilby in 1958. During the 1960s, we have Intel and AMD being born, while IBM was developing the first automated mass production facility for transistors. From the 70s to 2010, we saw the rise of computing power starting with the Intel 4004 on November 15, 1971, which had 2,300 transistors and performed a whopping 60,000 operations per second at 740 kilohertz. Every year, these companies would show off some new computer chip with at least 20% improvement in speed. However, something started happening around 2005. As transistors got smaller and smaller, things got weird. It was not a coincidence that right at that time, AMD released the first dual-core processor, the Athlon 64X2, followed by Intel the very next year with their Core 2 dual processor, E6320, initiating what would be the trend for the next years to come. It was during this time that we would see the final stretch from 1 to 5 GHz, where the focus turned to other components that would help ameliorate the processor capabilities. Since getting smaller transistors became a huge challenge, setting the stage for the rise of multi-core processors. From the first transistors at 10 microns up till 2009, the size dropped to 32 nanometers, which represents a decrease of about 312.5 times. In contrast, we were only able to decrease this size six times since then, and from 32 nanometers to the most recent, or at the making of this video, 5 nanometers. But in contrary to popular belief, the problem here is not with Moore's law, which is alive and well. Instead, the problem these companies are facing since 2005 has to do with Denard's law, or Denard's MOSFET scaling. Denard scaling predicts that while the number of transistors would double, the energy consumption would remain the same. But ever since we've passed the 65 nanometer range, it was also predicted that this rule would no longer be sustained because the power consumption for scaling beyond this point is calculated as S squared, while the chip computing capacity decreases with a rate of 1 over S squared. In other words, the smaller you go, the more energy is needed. This means that for a chip to work properly, it would either have to completely shut off parts of it on what they call the dark silicon, operate at lower frequencies, or rearrange the chip to be more energy efficient. All of this happens because of power leakage that increases as the transistor size decreases, and this means heat. In other words, the heat dissipation becomes a huge problem for the chip, which generates anomalies in processing or even renders the processor useless. This is the main reason why we've been stuck in between 3 and 5 gigahertz for the past few years, because increasing clock speed also means heat. But graphene has a much better thermal conductivity than silicon, and I mean by far. We have measured range in between 3000 and 5000 watt per meter Kelvin at room temperature, while silicon is about 148. So there are many things at play here, and the first one is that by mixing graphene with copper, it can help dissipate heat from the processor. 
something that has become more and more crucial for the past few years. This technology is already used by Team Group, which uses this mix in their SSDs, and they achieved an overall 8-30% to improvement in heat dissipation. As expected, this technology will only get better in the next 5 years and we'll see a lot more hardware utilizing graphene for heat dissipation. However, heat is not the only thing that graphene can handle well. It also can take higher frequencies. To be more precise, the terahertz frequency, which is where the 1000 GHz processor idea came out of. There are a few things to discuss here. First is that although graphene can reach much higher frequencies, the band gap to create logic circuits is still in research phase. Silicon, for instance, is used as a semiconductor because it has the ability to conduct or insulate depending on energy. So at low energy, electrons cannot flow, but if you increase the energy just enough to push the electrons through the so-called conduction band, it allows them to flow free like a conductor. This is a very simplified explanation of how transistors work. There are currently a few proposed ways to create the band gap in graphene, but the most promising is what they call the negative resistance. This happens when a certain current is passing through graphene, which causes the voltage to drop, hence negative resistance. This approach will allow researchers to create an XOR gate with only three graphene field effect transistors, whereas with conventional silicon it takes eight or more. From this you get two things, not only you can go smaller with logic gates, but graphene can operate at much higher frequencies and in theory could reach at least 400 GHz. This number comes from the experiment conducted with a single graphene transistor that clocked at 427 GHz. This is why the magic angle of bilayer graphene is so important, because the angle alignment switch can effectively change the state from insulator to conductor and therefore some sort of band gap can be done. Regardless, the first graphene chips in the next 5 years will smoke the fastest silicon chip by a margin of at least 10 times. But then again, the number of transistors might be much lower, which might take some time to catch up with silicon. Recently, in 2019, a team led by Alonso Calafel proposed a way to use graphene in quantum computing. This is extremely important because quantum computers are notoriously difficult to make and often require special conditions to work, like really low temperatures. Just to give an idea of the importance here, according to the two major banks in North America, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, suggested that in the next 10 years, quantum computer will be a $10 billion addressable market, while the latter believes that by 2021, it will be already a $29 billion industry. By now, you most likely know well how computers work, and as I mentioned before, we are reaching the physical limits of silicon to make the smallest transistor possible. Not because it is impossible, it is just that the smaller you get, the more quantum effects start to take over the model and everything starts to behave in a weird way. The idea behind quantum computers is to use the state of atoms or electrons with their spin or photons with their polarity, and at the end of the day, it works similarly to the computer bit. The difference is that in a computer, a bit is a physical allocation in a chip that can be either on or off. When you have many of them, you can store information as zeros and ones, but all of this happens in parallel, which takes space and have to be processed one at a time. In a quantum world, a bit is called a qubit, and in this case, we will talk about using photons as a qubit. The information is stored as the polarization of the photon, but the awesome thing with the system is that both states exist at the same time to what they call superposition. But just like conventional computers, you will need logic gates to measure and or alter the state of them. When making quantum logic gates has always been a problem. Out of the many challenges that this industry has faced throughout the years, graphene offers something new, where in theory it could be used to create two qubit logic gates, which works by using signal photons whose weak interaction with the environment makes them perfectly suitable for encoding and transmitting quantum information. Alonso Calafel, in a recent article for Nature, proposes a way to use graphene nanoplasmonic quantum swap logic gate. I know, it's a mouthful. This gate relies on the Zeno effect, also known as the Turing paradox, which basically means, from Wikipedia, is a feature of quantum mechanical systems allowing a particle's time evolution to be arrested by measuring it frequently enough with respect to some chosen measurement setting. So in this case, two layers of graphene are used in what they call the graphene nanoribbons that are brought closely together so that the plasmonic modes couple to each other via column interaction. 
this interaction is the basis of the graphene quantum gauge. And that is not all it offers too. Graphene could open the possibilities of quantum computers that operate at room temperature, something that was always thought to be impossible. And to be fair, the article is quite extensive and there's a lot of information there that I don't fully understand. After all, I'm not a theoretical physicist. I'm just a biotechnologist, data scientist, motion graphic, 3D model and animator, graphic design, and above all, a graphene enthusiast. But then again, even Richard Feynman would say that if you think you know quantum mechanics, you don't know quantum mechanics. I think he would actually be proud of my attempt here, and so should you, so thumbs up for the win. Going back to the topic... What is important to know here is how versatile graphene is turning out to be. So much so that there is a lot of interest from private companies into graphene, since quantum computing is something expensive and requires extensive research. This is why companies and universities are coming together, as is the case of Archer, an Australian company that is investing heavy in the industry. It announced back in May 2018 that it would partner with University of Sydney and Ecole Polytechnique for a strategic commercial development and industry partnership. All of this is thanks to the recent discovery of the magic angle that may open the possibilities for quantum computing to be achieved at room temperature, allowing practical, non-disruptive solutions that could facilitate the scaling up the technology. We are definitely in the brink of something big here, folks, and graphene is the key to all of this. Just like plastic and silicon, graphene will revolutionize everything. Alright folks, that's it. We're done here.